I foreshadowed this particular plot since 2010 when I wrote the first strike novel. The cult that appears in this book was once a commune, a commune at which some very dark things happened, as we find out in this book, and it's somewhere that Strike, the detective, um, spent six months as a child. And he's always thought of that, those six months as the worst part of his childhood. So I always knew that one day we would go back to this place that Strike remembers, this farm, and something very dark would have taken the place of the commune where he spent six months as a child. I've always been very, very interested in mind control. I've always been very interested in groupthink and therefore in cults. So it's something I always wanted to explore somehow in a book. So as I say, in 2010 when I started really thinking about how the whole series would take shape, I did foreshadow this because I thought this is going to be the, the time when I get to explore those things that interest me so much. And I love world building and creating this cult, really thinking about what kind of cult I believe would take fire now in, um, uh, you know, as we're a couple of decades into the 21st century, what would it take to hook people in, perhaps particularly young people, but as we see in the book, it's not only young people who are attracted to this cult, but successful cults um, really manage to hook onto something in the zeitgeist. They understand what people want to hear, what people are trying to escape, and I think that the Universal Humanitarian Church does that very effectively within the book. So my jumping off point for the cult were the words that the cult leader says the very first time that Robin uh, enters one of their meetings in their temple. And the words are, I admit the possibility. The possibility that there is a deity, the possibility that there is life beyond the earthly plane. I think that's a a good way of hooking people who may consider themselves atheists or skeptics. None of us can say for sure there is nothing beyond, but by saying I admit the possibility, the cult leader cleverly opens that door one inch and people want to come back. So that for me was the um, sort of ground zero for this cult. Do you admit the possibility? The supreme leader of this cult is a man called Jonathan Wace, who is uh, extremely charismatic. He's not fire and brimstone. He very successfully conveys the message that um, he's humble, uh, he's open-minded, he's tolerant. He, as a couple of the characters talk about, seeing him as the father they wish they'd had, or feeling that he too understands what it is to be an outsider. He's not what Robin expects the first time she, she visits the temple. She's expected someone who's very fired up, a sort of evangelical figure, but he seems quite self-deprecating. At the same time, he's very sexy. He's a good-looking older man. He's exactly what I think many of us would almost aspire to be. He seems very certain at the same time. He, he, he appears superficially to be questioning. He's very inclusive. He seems to be very inclusive. Um, he, and he's, he's preaching um, a, a seductive message. He's saying there is truth in all religions. Let's unite them. Let's come together across cultures and explore what are the common truths in religions. Now, that's an interesting starting point. And it's certainly something that I think about a lot myself because I, I've always been fascinated in mythologies, how across mythologies and very discrete cultures, cultures that won't have interacted for thousands of years, similar archetypes arise, similar creation myths arise, because that seems to me to tell us something about what it is to be human. So the differences are fascinating, but the commonalities are equally fascinating. And Wace is on top of that. Wace is saying, you know, we've all got a different take on this, but let's bring this together. So he's clever. He's, um, he's either the Messiah or a complete charlatan. So 
what draws people in is the potential for good. And Jonathan Wace is very, very good at selling his church as something that does an enormous amount of good. It was funny how I came to the I Ching, funny because I've had an old copy of the I Ching in my house for probably about, might even be 30 years, and I hadn't opened it. And I think I must have, I can't even remember buying it, but I, it must have come from a second-hand bookshop because it's got a penciled 20p inside it. So I probably picked it up at a second-hand bookshop, and I have no memory of opening it. And I was looking for something for the epigraphs um, that would, the chapter epigraphs, that would express some of the obliqueness, but the simplicity of the universal um, humanitarian church's ethos. And I picked up the I Ching and started flicking through it. And I thought, this is it, this is perfect. Um, and for those who don't know what the I Ching is, it's not really a fortune telling device like tarot or crystal balls or anything. It's um, over 2000 years old, it is thought of as an oracle. So I became kind of fascinated by it and I started to understand why odd people have become very interested in the I Ching. It actually became part of the plot. So um, one of the church leaders, Jonathan Wace's wife, is particularly interested in the I Ching, but she doesn't use it as it's supposed to be used. But I had to learn how to use it properly so I could, so I could work out how she would be abusing it. This was an interesting book to write because it's, um, it's really a split location book. So while Strike is largely London-based and conducting the investigation from the office as usual, Robin is in Norfolk for a huge part of the book. And it was interesting because firstly, by separating them, I think they become closer because they're writing letters to each other. It's their only means of communication. Robin has to smuggle these letters out and Strike is smuggling them in. And that was an interesting part of the book for me because their relationship really does deepen through physical separation, which is odd, but can happen. And then the other important part of the book, and I, I visited Norfolk and I, I, I wanted to get it right, is the Norfolk landscape. Now, I hope people from Norfolk will forgive me for saying that I find that very flat landscape a little bit sinister. I don't think I'm, a, I'm alone in that. It has its beauty, no question. That's why I put the commune that Strike lived at as a child in Norfolk in the first place, because I do find something slightly sinister about the flatness of that landscape and the, the sort of marshy parts of Norfolk. Um, that said, she said, not wanting people from Norfolk to hate me. Um, I can remember a very happy childhood holiday in Croma, which also features in the book. So um, yes, it's not all bad. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I found it very satisfying actually to put a good chunk of the book outside London. It just changed the tone and feeling of the book a lot. Researching the locations is, is really important to me. This is such a diff different series to the Potter series where I invented literally everything. So while, yes, London was in the Potter books and big cities were mentioned in the Potter books, I was always inventing something that was within those places and those cities. King's Cross, obviously, I'm inventing a totally fictional platform and so on. And in the strike books, I really do try and use real locations as much as I can. It's satisfying, it, it, it grounds the series, it makes it real for me, and hopefully for the reader. Sometimes you invent things, obviously I've invented a lot of buildings that lie off uh, Lion's Mouth Lane in, in Norfolk. But um, yeah, I do visit these places. Well, Strike's a Cornishman, so he's very drawn to the sea. He's always happy being near the sea. Uh, so I think they've been to Whitstable, Cromer, Skegness. Obviously, we've been to St. Moore's. Well, like a lot of people, I, you know, I do love the coast, but it, it adds something to Strike's character because we see him initially as such an urban person. You know, he's London-based. He, he works out of the heart of London. It just adds something to his character because he's drawn to the sea, but that has a, such a strong association of childhood for him. So I always see it that way. 
when he heads for the coast, we normally find out something character-wise about Strike. That's, that's the significance for me. A kind of a reckoning has come for Strike, I think, in this book. He's finally, finally, trying to look after himself physically a bit more. At the end of the previous book, he was physically in a very bad state, out of neglect of himself. So he's, he's tried to um, get a handle on this. He's lost a bit of weight. He's vaping instead of smoking. He's, he's making an effort. But of course, there's an, another reckoning has happened, which is that he's finally, and I'm sure the readers will roll their eyes that it took him so long, he's acknowledged to himself finally what he really feels for Robin. So he's just past 40, often a time, I think, when people start to take stock of their lives. You're no longer in the first flush of youth. And so that's the place he is in his life at the moment. He's come to admit to himself that certain things have to change. And I can't say any more than that because it would give away too much. I think Strike does reach several reckonings in this book, and one of them is definitely re-evaluating certain things in his past and coming to a reckoning with his sister Lucy, and also with his new half-sister Prudence, who of course has always been his half-sister, but he's never really had a relationship with her. And that's an area of growth, but it's painful growth, as growth often is, of course. Um, he has to accept that some of the pigeonholes he's put people into no longer apply. He sees his sister Lucy a little more clearly. I can't say too much, but it was very cathartic to write because I've always known this was coming. So it's very satisfying to reach the place where you finally share things with the reader. Stryker's obviously experienced quite a lot of loss in his life. The death of his mother is obviously huge. And more recently, he has experienced the loss of his surrogate mother, Joan. And his uncle is failing in this book. So these things too come to you as you age, the loss of these people close to you. And I think my editor said to me after reading this book, I really feel him getting older and I want to depict someone who is aging. We are very youth obsessed. We are very obsessed with aging in a negative sense, but I see it differently. He's gaining wisdom, he's gaining perspective. And as painful as loss is, if you do learn from it, and I speak very personally here, and if it does give you a heightened sense of life is to be lived, do, do the thing now, say the thing now, share with people that you love, that you love them now, that's a positive. You know, these things come to all of us. So I see Strike as becoming, inch by inch, a little more emotionally intelligent, in this book. You know, he's often compartmentalized his emotions as a coping mechanism, and he has had a lot of loss, but he is becoming that little bit more self-aware in this book, and I think that's probably overdue. Well, Strike, as we know, has pretty, pretty much been through a different woman in every book, other than book five, Troubled Blood, where he didn't have any dalliances. That book was really dominated by another woman, his aunt Joan, who was dying. Um, he does, uh, he's not completely celibate in this book, that's for sure. He has what I would say is probably the most reckless and stupid liaison he's had in a long time, but there you go. Um, I don't think it's so much that he's wanting to concentrate on his investigative work because he's always put that first in any case and women in his life have indeed complained about that. It's more that he is becoming aware that the woman he really wants is not one of the people he keeps having flings with. You know, it, that's really what's taken the place of long-term dalliances I think he's now at the point where he's, think, he's thinking all or nothing. Almost, almost. He's sort of getting there. So Robin volunteers for the job of going undercover in this cult. She um, is successfully recruited at the London Temple and then sent to what is 
obviously the church doesn't call it this, but what is the number one indoctrination centre, which is in deep in the countryside in Norfolk. We've seen her go undercover before. We've seen her adopt a fake name, wear wigs and so on. This is, this is full time. This is 24 hours a day. She has to be inhabit this persona that she's built up. This is a cult that has very successfully defended itself against any kind of legal challenge. Um, there are parallels with real life cults there. This cult has successfully indoctrinated people so that even if they manage to break free, they are very frightened about talking to the press and so on. So I, I can't reveal too much, but obviously this is a very, very, very high pressure situation. And as often happens with these kinds of cults, you are kept underfed, underslept, and you're subject to enormous emotional pressure. So Robin faces all of those things plus the constant danger that people will realise she's not who she says she is. Because she's posing as a, a wealthy young woman whose marriage has been called off. So she's posing as a woman who is really looking for something to, sh to fill that emotional hole. And um, yeah, she's got to sustain that over a few months. Robin is putting herself in physical danger in a way that she's never done before. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but for women in the cult, once successfully indoctrinated, um, there is a duty that is uh, dangerous. I can't say any more, but yeah, she's really putting herself physically in harm's way and emotionally too. This, this sort of thing really takes an emotional toll. And of course she's separated from any kind of support system, which is, you know, cult 101. The first thing they do is try and weaken family ties. And they, they will even, um, the Universal Humanitarian Church will even split up people who join the cult together. So there's a very deliberate attempt to weaken any personal ties so that your loyalty flows upwards, can't flow sideways, you can't form alliances with people on your level. Yeah, so it's very, very, very testing. When we meet Robin in this book, she's now in a stable, happy relationship with her CID officer, Ryan Murphy, uh, which Strike, of course, hates. Um, so she's in a very different place uh, emotionally, and yet she still wants to go undercover, which potentially means a separation of weeks or months, um, because she, like Strike, is putting the job first. And this, that in itself probably represents the single biggest, um, not change exactly, but over the course of these seven books, we've seen Robin turn into someone who prioritises investigation over her private life. That was something she really struggled with in the first couple of years with the agency because she had a very unsupportive partner. But now she's really quite clear, this is what I am, this is what I do. And you know, if you want to be with me, you will accept that. I think we see her in this book absolutely come into her own. Her resourcefulness and her resilience um, are exemplary. I certainly couldn't do what she, she did, but she, yeah, I think she does an amazing job in this book. As readers of the previous book will know, Robin has been in a state of some emotional confusion. She admitted to herself that she was in love with Strike and then did her damnedest to fall out of love with Strike because she just does not see that as a viable situation. And he's also not really made himself into the most attractive long-term prospect, has he? He's, you know, pretty secretive about his sex life. She finds things out secondhand. And in the spirit of, I need to move on, she said yes to a date with a man who is supremely eligible. You know, he's a, he's a CID officer. He understands that aspect of her life. He's charming. He's kind. What's not to love? And... Yeah, their relationship has clearly been going from strength to strength. We see them together in the very first chapter and it's clearly working well. And as I say, Strike is absolutely hating that. But many would say that's his own fault and I would be one of them. Um, 
So what's it giving her? I think it's giving her something she's actually never had before. She's having a relationship with a man who is not constantly telling her she's in the wrong job, who's not harking back constantly to things that happened to her previously, who is letting Robin be Robin. And that is a very new experience. I think on a professional level, with this book, Robin, it's not so much that she comes into her own because she's already done amazing things, but she does do something that no one else at that agency has ever had to do. You know, it's incredibly demanding what she undertakes in this, in this book. So she's, I suppose, proven herself in spades in this book. Um, she was the perfect person to go into the cult, and Strike knows she's the right person for the job, but even so, he's a little worried, as any of us would be worried, watching someone go undercover in a place like this. So professionally, they really and truly are now equals, total equals. There's no longer is there any sense that she's the Watson and he's the Holmes. I think they are now totally on a par. Um, personally, they're in a very interesting place because, as I say, Strike has now acknowledged what he's been f fighting for six books. He now admits to himself what he feels at precisely the moment where she's thought, well, there's no point, is there? I mean, it, it, there's no hope for us. So I'm, I'm now with Ryan. So that's an interesting thing to write. Their friendship, I hope the reader will you know, we'll, we'll understand this because it's certainly how I see it. Their friendship is the most powerful thing in both of their lives. You know, I'm not sure either of them fully recognise until this book how much, how close they've become. Because in being separated, Strike realises how alone he feels without her. He recognises that he would normally, if feeling a bit low, he'd ring Robin. Not necessarily for a personal chat, but he just likes speaking to Robin. And meanwhile, she's in this cult and realises that the person that she thinks about most when feeling vulnerable or exhausted is Strike. He becomes her touchstone. She imagines herself explaining to him the ludicrous and the sometimes scary things that are going on inside the cult. So, yeah, as I say, in separating them, I think I make them bizarrely far more close. So the agency generally speaking, has a bit of a problem with the sixth detective. So we have five permanent detectives at the moment, and then they have a new sixth person. Um, having lost Nutley in the last book, they now have Little John. And Little John is not someone everyone takes to immediately, put it that way. One of the things I really enjoyed writing in this book, um, I think watching Strike manage this agency without Robin around... <laughs> is it was fun to write because Robin, generally speaking, does supply a bit of emotional intelligence and balance. Not strikes forte. But he's ex-military, you know, he's, he's, he's used to sort of telling people to do stuff and that's it, it's done. And the other person I really love writing is Pat, the office manager. And for Pat fans, and I know there are Pat fans out there because I've spoken to them, Pat fans will... I think really enjoy this book. And I can't say any more than that, but Pat reveals some um, unexpected aspects of her character in this book. You see, I'm queen of backstory. I love my backstory. I usually know way more backstory than anyone needs on all of my characters. And when it comes to Strike and Robin, that's useful and important because I know where they're coming from always and I know what may or may not eventually be revealed. And it helps you keep the character consistent if you've really fleshed out their, their past. So I have a file on my laptop where Strike and Robin's backstories are very fully written. And some of it's appeared in the novels so far. Some of it may never be in there, but I always know where they're coming from and I always know what they, they would remember and they would feel. On other characters, Pat, for example, I also have quite a lot of backstory. I knew when I created her, what her family situation was, how old she was, um, what her husband was called. So I have little files on all of the constant characters. Yeah, I can't say too much, it's quite frustrating, but I normally know 
on pretty much every character, I normally know more than anyone else needs to know. Well, The Running Grave is from a quotation by Dylan Thomas, when, like a running grave, time tracks you down. So for me, that the significance of that quotation is um, old deeds catching up with people, obviously also mortality catching up with people. So Strike's sense of his own mortality is, is important in this book. But interestingly, the Norfolk poet George Barker also used the phrase, the running grave, in his poem, and that is also mentioned in the book. So I think it's a, it's a it, although it's given translators for this novel a, a huge headache because the running grave doesn't quite work in other languages. I love it. I think it's very evocative, the idea of the grave pursuing you, like a wave, but also all of us knowing one day we must die, which which can actually be a reminder to live, and that too is in this book. Strike really now starting to ask questions of himself of, about how he wants to spend the second half of his life. So it really worked for me. I personally, I love having the expanded agency. As they become more successful, they simply can't cover everything on their own, obviously. Um, so from a practical point of view and a realism point of view, subcontractors have to come in. But it's fun to play with the interpersonal dynamics. Uh, Midge is a character I absolutely love. Um, she's uh, obviously, in this book, the only other female detective on the team. She's very resourceful. I find her a lot of fun to write. She's pretty feisty. She's also very direct with Strike in a way that he's direct with others. And that's fun to play with because although Robin and Strike have certainly rowed, she probably wouldn't go where Midge goes during a row. So um, it brings out aspects of Strike and Robin's characters, having them interact with this, this bunch of subcontractors, and I really enjoy that. <laughs>